Hi, and welcome to another uh, interview with the Animation Masters uh, through Animation Salvation. Today we're interviewing Jean Denis from ILM, and uh, thanks very much for giving us some of your time, Jean Denis, and welcome. No problem. Thanks for having me. No, th thank you. I, I guess I'll call you JD from now on, which is great, because I'm DJ and you're JD, so... And it's like uh, early morning there, and it's late at night here, so we're we're pretty much exact opposites. <laughs> No, so um, it, JD, if you could tell us a bit about uh, your experience in the industry, how long have you been working in the industry, and um, maybe a quick, quick history of how you got to where you are. I'm sure mm -hmm. everyone out there would love to know a, a bit about that. Uh, so let's see. I well, let's start at the beginning. Um, I I was born in Switzerland. Um, didn't really know what to do until I was around 20 years old. I always liked movies. Always watched movies. Um, my dad had a huge movie collection, so I was always exposed to movies and watch, you know, classics and, you know, grew up in the 80s movies, the Goonies and Big Trouble China <laughs> and, of course, all the effects movies from ILM. So after gradua um, graduation in Switzerland, I was thinking about doing something with computers, but in Switzerland we only had, um, it was mostly programming and then I think you had art school that was more focused on on just drawing and painting had nothing to do with uh, filmmaking, especially not computer animation. And my drawing skills weren't that good, so I wanted to try something with computers. But I didn't quite know what to do. I liked video games, I liked movies, I liked um, effects especially. So I started researching some schools, and I think there was Animation World Network that had a, um, a list of I don't know, the best animation schools in the world. <clears throat> And I had no nice. idea what that was. So I checked it out, and then they had, I think, the first 10 schools were profiled um, beyond just the website. And I sent an email to all those schools, and the first one to get back to me was um, the Academy of Art in San Francisco. So I researched them, and then, you know, it was close to ILM, it was close to Pixar, it was close to all those companies. Um, and I applied there, and they didn't need a portfolio. So it was very convenient for me because I had nothing. Um, and after you know talking to my parents and they're okay with me leaving and you know helping me out financially, uh, I moved here in fall 1999 actually, and then I started um, the, the bachelor you know path um, in animation, um, but I started with visual effects first, and then I realized it's all about programming and scripting and math and physics and I wasn't really good at any of that, <laughs> so then I tried animation and I really really liked it. So I continued with that and then graduated in 2003 in spring. Um, did what I already did. I sent out demo reels and nothing happened. And I kept working on my work and kept sending out demo reels. And in around <laughs> Christmas 2003, it worked. Um, I got interviews. I got responses. And then um, the final one was uh, ILM in January. And they were saying that they're going to give me a visa because as a foreigner, I needed the visa. And most of the interviews, oh, yes. they were saying that, well... We might hire you, it might be you know project, but we don't know about the visa. And I only had a year um, to stay in San Francisco. Because once you graduate from school, they give you one year and it's called a practical, uh, it's OPT, optional practical training, I think. Something like that. Um, right. So that was the biggest thing on my list. It wasn't really where I was going to work or how much money I was going to make because I didn't want to spend four years here, almost four years, and then go back home <laughs> where there's nothing. So of course, <laughs> um, the offer from ILM was fantastic, besides being a dream company of mine. So, of course, I said yes immediately, and uh, they were very um, generous in, in the offer, and they gave me an internship, and gave me the visa, and then that's where I started. I started in 2004, and have been there ever since. So it's probably, you know, six years, going on to seven soon. Um, wow. Yeah, I went from, they had their very last internship, um, that was on Star Wars Episode Three. And then there were massive layoffs, and I remember surviving all of that because I was an intern. I mean, that's my theory, because it was cheap. So <laughs> I was doing lots of work for no money, um, and then I think that saved me. And then since then, they actually don't do internships anymore. It's now mostly um, project hires. So it's it opened up a lot. A lot of people can start at ILM, but it's really difficult to stay. It's it's a bit unfortunate. It's something that I, I feel is going on in, in at a lot of companies where it's mostly project hires. So you stay there for a couple mm. months, six months, maybe a year, and then you have to move on and look somewhere else. So I'm super lucky to have gone in there really early, and especially now with, with wife and kid and house and everything, it would be really difficult to find, you know, to look for jobs, and uh, you would have to move to, 
moved to LA, to San Francisco, to New York, and, and all over the world. And it's, I don't know how people do it with families. It's really, really hard. So anybody out there listening who's doing that, uh, <laughs> huge respect for that. And it's really difficult. So it's, it's very inspiring that, you know, people, people keep doing that. And I wish it was, it was different. I wish they would do um, different things with project hires, but the current climate is a bit, a bit tough. Yeah, that's definitely seems to be the way that the entire industry is going is more project based. Uh, there is no job security anymore, as you said. Mm -hmm. So now uh, you, you said something interesting about coming from a foreign country uh, mm -hmm. because a lot of people want to know how to get into America. Right. And so you, you went through the route of getting a degree in America. Yes, because when I started, Animation Mentor didn't exist. Um, right. So I had to go somewhere to learn animation. And it's interesting. Um, eventually, thanks to the academy, I got a job because I took classes there. After I graduated, I took one more class in fall. And back then, we had teachers from Pixar that were doing exercises and short movies. And, and that helped a lot. And thanks to them, my uh, the quality of my reel went up, and then I got a job. But... It's interesting. Um, you really, a lot of people think that if they go to that school or any school, um, you know, that has great teachers, that they will get a job immediately. And it really is that you mm -hmm. get back what you are willing to to put in. So all the guys that worked really, really hard eventually got a job, and and the ones that are expecting to just get a great reel, you know, while doing nothing, are still looking. And it's, and that's a a big thing for all those guys that want to move from a different country to America or anywhere else. And think that well, you know, this school has a good reputation and it's going to get me a job. It's not true, and it's the same thing with Animation Mentor. It's a fantastic school. And it has great mentors, but you know, you still have to work really, really hard. It's not a, it's not a checklist that you can go through, and at the end, you have a great reel. So, I mean, yes. if for those the foreigners that are listening, it's definitely, um, you have to work really, really hard. You have to practice a lot. Um, but it helped me. Um, to come here because for a visa, I need a bachelor degree. You need you need a degree, so I think that's still something that you have to do if you want to come at least to America. So I can't I can't yes. do a, a animation school in Switzerland and then apply, uh, you know, for instance, for ILM. So I'm not quite sure how it will work now if you have no degree. They might have other conditions for visas. I'm not too sure, but at least back then you needed the bachelor or a master's degree. No, I think it's the same today. In fact, it's getting stricter from my understanding. Okay. Uh, and I'm not sure either if Animation Mentor, I think that, that it does count as a bachelor degree when you finish, but I'm not 100% sure. So that's something if you are overseas and looking to get a job in America, you might mm -hmm. not want to do something like Animation Mentor, unfortunately, which uh, actually question. that's surprising um, to me. Yeah, I would have to ask. But one of the founders sits actually right next to me at work. I need to ask him, but I thought there – they're doing a lot of work, you know, to make it really good for the, really easy for the students and to find jobs. And they have gotten a lot yes. of jobs, so I'm sure there must be some way that it works. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that they've got that worked out mm -hmm. to where it's uh, it's eligible for immigration. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's something that uh, we we should look into. Actually, I might post that up. And the website you were talking about, where you went to AWN and searched for their schools, mm -hmm. uh, the address just for uh, the listeners is schools.awn.com. Okay. So you can go in there and, and search in the school database. So that's that's really good. Now, I was wondering also, you, you mentioned that um, you first put your reel out and got no response. Right. And uh, how long did it take you until you actually got a response? And what were the changes that you made that you found um, got you the response? Um, so the first thing that happened is um, one good thing that the Academy is doing, not one good thing, but one of the good things that they're doing is at the end, you take all your clips and they ask you to do a 10 second reel of everything that you have. And that they're asking of all the students so that during the job fair that they have at the end of graduation, uh, companies can come and check out their work. So I did that and that gave me, that led to interviews at ESC back then for the Matrix for the second one. Um, and they were desperate, yes. they needed a lot of people and that would have worked, but I didn't have a visa. My OPT started, I think, two months after graduation because I was I was too lazy. I didn't file in the paperwork early enough. So that mm -hmm. didn't work out. And the same thing was for Starship Troopers 2. I didn't remember I don't remember what company was working on it, but I remember they were asking the Academy and um they were asking me but I didn't have a visa. So I think my whole future would have been different if I had filed in my paperwork differently. <laughs> um but so that didn't work out. So what I did 
um, I started looking online for free, you know, internship, group projects, stuff like that. You just practice. Um, right. But I did send out my reel to about 50 companies in May. So nothing worked out. And it took me up until December. So what I did was I went back to school in August, September for one more class, which you can do at the academy. It's a, I think it was personal enrichment class, I think it's called. And the thing that changed was that um, just the quality was better. It was just more focused. Um, at the at the the Pixar classes, they were they were having you do dialogue pieces, pantomime, weight exercises. So it was you were really showing off specific skills. Um, mm. And I guess that was then good enough to draw the attention. But the other thing is, in May, usually companies are not really looking. Uh, at least that's my experience. It's you have um, all the big blockbuster movies that come out in May, so you're, you're, the shows end around March, April, at least at ILM, and then it's really a dry season, and it's really hard to find jobs then, whereas Christmas is crunch for most shows, so I think it's always a bit easier to find jobs in Christmas, except Pixar. They do internships starting actually right now in May, so it's kind of the, one of the few companies, <clears throat> I think. Right. It all depends. Okay. Some, some of my students just wrote me emails and they got internships or apprenticeships at Rhythm and Hughes. So it's maybe internships start in May, but bigger offers or jobs maybe later. I'm not too sure. I just I can only speak for ILM. Maybe I shouldn't speak about ILM. I don't know if I'm allowed to. <laughs> but right, just, yes. That's just what for I'm, your experience. From my experience it was... that it's uh, summer is difficult and Christmas is easier, I guess. Right, okay. No, I'm sure that's going to help out a lot of people. Um who are listening and wanting to get into the States and just wanting to get into a big company. Mm -hmm. So do you remember how long, in the end, how long was your reel that got you the job as opposed to how long was your reel that wasn't getting attention? That's a good was question. Was there a big difference in the length? No. Um, the first one was probably around two minutes and the second one probably like a minute and a half, two minutes. It was about the same. Um, but that was what we were told right, back okay. then, that it needs to be two minutes. Whereas nowadays... Um, Last thing I heard was if you have a fantastic 30 seconds is better than an okay two minutes. Um, I wouldn't go below 30 right. seconds. That's kind of um, cutting it close. But a minute, really solid one minute, I think is okay nowadays. Okay. Yeah. No, I agree. I think my reel is just around one minute 30. So, mm -hmm. But I should probably trim some of the fat off of it. And that's after 15 years in the industry. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've done a lot of uh, work that... I wish my name wasn't on, but you know that's same with anyone's career. I think. Yeah, I think once you start um, working, you realize it's it's the work you're doing for for clients or for movies. It's it's not your real. You're doing it for someone. You're being paid to do that work for someone. So you can't always, you know, you can't be resistant and and not do what they're saying. And sometimes you won't agree with their choices or the shot will not turn out the way you would hope that it that they did. But you know that's yes. That's something you have, you have to realize the moment you start working. It's that you're doing work for someone else. Yeah, and you and the director don't always see eye to eye. No. no. <laughs> but as long as he's making the, paying those paychecks, you got to do what he says. Yep. Now that's a really good perspective. And um, uh, there's another question I wanted to ask about uh, the visas and getting in was mm -hmm. the internship. Does the internship qualify to get you a visa? And do you think that it was important to be there, like in San Francisco, to where you could physically go to the companies, or was the uh, application process more um, a distance thing? Mm, that's a good question. I think it helped me just because they will call and say, can you come tomorrow, or can you fly to LA, um, and you can say yes, and it's you know it's cheaper for them, and it saves them time, so I think it does help, although I, I do hear from a lot of people that get hired over phone interviews. Um, people who applied at Weta or even um, I think even at ILM where it was a phone interview because someone was in Tennessee and I mean it still works it's it's still you know if once you get to interview it's about them learning about you if, if to see if you fit into the company and if you're not a complete freak but it's mostly your real <laughs> if, if your real is not good then you won't get any calls back so it's I think that's the biggest biggest hurdle is to get a real together that will convince people to call you and then hopefully after that interview is just a formality, hopefully. Right. Okay, excellent. Well, um, moving on to your actual career, uh, of all the projects that you've worked on since you've been in the industry, mm -hmm. uh, which one would you say was your favorite or stands out from the rest? Wow. Um, 
Well, definitely Star Wars Episode Three because it was my first job. Um, it was a nice. dream company, and it was a, a huge fan of Star Wars. It was a complete dream. So to be able to have that as my first movie, um, it probably spoiled everything <laughs> afterwards. Because it was yes. great, because it was such a huge show. So many shots. Um, it had stunt work, it had creature work, it had mocap. You just learned so much. And, and Lucas was really open to your ideas. It was very creative. You weren't you know, micromanage for every frame. It was really a, a dream show, I have to say, for, for my very first job. So that stands out in a huge way. And I was really lucky to have worked on um, Indiana Jones and Star Trek because those are all franchises that I grew up with and that I loved. So they probably stand out a lot. Um, and then I would say Transformers 2, just because it was my first show as a lead. Um, and it was a really tough show. It was... It was you know, hard animation. It was it was a very demanding client, but demanding in a good way. Michael Bay has a really good eye for things, and you can you can't sneak things past him. So I think those shows <laughs> they really stand out because <clears throat> they ask a lot of you. It was a huge learning um, experience. Right. Okay. No, this must have been really uh, really exciting and fun to work on, and then to see your work up on the big screen as well. Yes. And go there. I'm yeah, sure that's, that's still, quite a. That's still fantastic when you do your animation, then you see your shot rendered and composited, and then at the end in the movies with sound. Uh, it's a huge thrill. That never gets old. And I'm always really happy, you know, because <laughs> my parents are still in Switzerland, so it's it's when they go see those movies, they might not always like the movies, but it's great for them to see my name in the credits, and it's, it's, it's hopefully, you know, a little way of giving back after everything they did for me and they paid for school and everything to have to say, oh, our son is, you know, worked on that movie. You know, it's, it's good for them. I always like that. Yeah, I'm sure. Yes. Um, who would you say was the most influential person throughout your career so far? That's a huge list, actually. Um, <clears throat> I think it would have to start at school, and um, it was Lisa Mullins. That was our um, character animation teacher. She is, uh, if I'm allowed to say that, she's the wife of Dave Mullins, who's at Pixar. So she has, you know, a huge background in animation. Um, and before that, the schools, the, the classes were more tutorial like where you go through the steps and you learn rigging you learn animation you learn play blast and renders and stuff like that and then there was my first uh, maya one class or oh, character animation one class with lisa mullins and it was so different she just taught you the principles with such energy and it just made sense and she showed examples and it was such a different feel in that class and but she was really tough she really told you if something worked or not she wouldn't be yeah, that's that's nice, you know, you get an A minus and you can move on. She would say, No, you know, this sucks and you need to work on this, you need to work on that. <laughs> and it set you straight and it was so good, it was so refreshing and it was it was so motivating to see what how she was doing it. Um so she was a huge influence. And then um just all the all the people that I work with at ILM, I mean, you know, starting with, with Sean Kelly who he saw my reel and he forwarded the reel at the company and he uh, he always denies it, but he helped me get in there. And then Glenn McIntosh and uh, Scott Benza, Rick O'Connor, it's all the supervisors and leads and, uh, and Dale Termitosi. There's so many people there. Um, Steve Applin, you know, there's there's s such talented animators. And it's the cool thing about working there, it was like a second school where you did your exercise at school. But once you start there, it's such a different environment. And it's there's so much more to being a professional animator than just doing good work, just uh, like from a technical point of view in animation. So... Mm. But it continues, you know, we have new guys starting at work and, and they're so much younger and they're so much better than I am and it's such a kick in the butt and it's so motivating. <laughs> so I think it's it's a huge influence all over and seeing people who do animation schools online and, and post things online, it's just it just continues. I think it's I'm I'm always online, I'm always checking things online and it's it's a constant um, you know, humbling yourself to see you always think that, yeah, I think I can do it. I can animate. And then you see a guy that just got out of school and it's so much better than what you're doing. And then you realize, oh, I, <laughs> yes. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> it just, you know, it still continues. Um, but, you know, all the guys at ILM, it's, it's a huge influence. And, you know, every time you watch a movie and it's, you think you've seen it and then you go watch Kung Fu Panda and you watch How to Train Your Dragon and up and it just, it continues to baffle you. You look at a shot and you go, holy crap, who did that? And then you look it up and... Mm. And you check their backgrounds, and you go, "Wow, that guy's just amazing." It's just it just continues. <clears throat> yeah, 
No, it's great to hear. So, yeah, so you're influenced uh, continually by mm -hmm. people around you. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, in in your career progression, did you find that the improvement with your skills came um, by a steady progression or were there major jumps or was it a combination of both? Definitely both. Um, it was pretty steady uh, throughout school, I would say. Um, well, no, actually, it was kind of slow, okay, until I was in class with Lisa Mullins. And that was a huge jump, <laughs> realizing how much fun it can be. Uh, and then it was a bit, you know, flattened out a bit. And then I got back to the academy in, in fall, and the picture class was taught by Scott Clark and Angus McLean. And that was another big jump, because it was a fantastic team where um, Scott he felt more like he was looking at a shot in a general point of view. How is the feeling? Is you know, is the story clear? And then um, Angus would look at it frame by frame from a technical point of view, and it was so good because it really, it really pushed you. Um, so I think that was a big jump, and and it was a big jump because I got a job. It helped me, um, you know, demo reel wise. Mm -hmm. And then the big jump was at work, just how you have to structure your animation to make it work within the pipeline. Um, and then it flattened out a bit more. And then I think it was, you know, it was probably Transformers 2 where just, you know, it, it pushed you in terms of the physical stuff and then how to be as a lead and um, mm. it gets, the interesting thing about animation is that, and I always tell that to my students, is that you learn animation and then after a while you get it, you get the principles, you get the technical thing and then it's all about your ideas, it's all about how original you are and what, what the ideas are you come up with. And that's probably the biggest thing that sets people apart. And that's something I struggle with a lot. It's just finding creative ideas. Because if you look at animation, all the movies nowadays from all the companies are really well done from a technical point of view. Where you could say, well, you know, the, the, the level is so high, it's, just, it's the same across the board. And then it's all about the story and the acting choices. And I think that's, that's the last, the biggest hurdle that you have as an, as an animator. So um, you will learn technique, yes. you will learn that, and you might flatten out, and you get, you know, a great movie that pushes you, and you realize new things, and you realize, oh, it's about this and that, and then at the end you get stuck <laughs> with the great ideas, <laughs> and it's such something I don't think you can really teach easily and learn easily. I mean, you can be exposed to great ideas and you know look at reference and movies and people around you, um, but you know I always meet people and. They're just at such a different class where, where you see them and you can give them an idea and then they give you 10 ideas back and they're all fantastic. And it's, I always feel like, wow, how did you, how did you get those ideas? How can I learn <laughs> to have, you know, to have those ideas? So it's, um, I don't know if that answers the question. I was ranting and rambling off. No, but you, you bring up a good point, and I think it's it's great that uh, I've been in the industry long enough to watch the industry itself mature mm -hmm. and go from something where everyone was struggling just to understand how to animate, you know, in 3D on the computer, mm -hmm. to where now it really is it, it is about the performance. And you are, I think, my prediction is that you are going to have uh, stars rise as animators because their performances are going to be so compelling as as animators mm -hmm. that they're going to really stand out the same way that actors do. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. you're um I don't know if you know anyone who's working on Megamind, but um some of the work that they're doing at Dreamworks is just unbelievable in the performance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it yeah, it's all the technicalities, all the technical aspects of the animation they've got down pat and now they've got some really good actors in there just truly giving great performances. Yeah. And um I think that's really what excites me most about animation today. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I went on my own rant there now. No, too, no. But, uh, <laughs> now we're now we're even. So, <laughs> well, th that being said, uh, about the the passionate side and the and the um, creative side. But before we move on, one book that really helped me in that aspect is um, I read a lot of Ed Hook's Acting for Animators, and mm -hmm. uh, there's a book written by Michael Chekhov yes. called To the Actor. Uh -huh. And he, he talks about a lot of ex exercises you can do to improve your imagination. And um, he talks about – you feel like you're going crazy when you do this, but you create a character in your head and you slowly train it over months and months. Uh, if, you, if you work really hard, you can do it over days. But mm -hmm. when you first start, it's going to be very hard just to picture this character in your head. And you picture them in every detail and then you start giving them directions on what to do and have them act out things in your head. And the better you can get at directing this this actor in your head, you'll, you'll find that he'll start reacting on his own. Mm 
mm-hmm. you'll give him direction and he'll fight you and do, and do the exact opposite. It's really amazing, mm-hmm. you know, this thing that you've got going on inside your own head. And I found that really helped me because then once I trained myself and done that for a period of time, now I can close my eyes and imagine my animation and mm-hmm. that character will take over and he'll lead that animation and that performance in my head into a whole new direction. Cool. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's To the Actor by Michael Chekhov. I don't know. I have that book and I read it read? Um, uh, in school and I definitely need to read that again. <laughs> There's just yeah. so many things, so many books that I bought while at school and then, you know, you read them halfway through and then I got to get back and get into that. But I, yeah, sounds like a great idea. And it's funny because it's not that my approach is, you know, that sophisticated and I'm not that good at it, but it's, that's how I plan out my animation is in my head because my drawing skills are not that good. And usually when I have my ideas and I, and I draw them and, you know, with stick figures, it just looks so bad that it kind of <laughs> yes. hinders my imagination. I, I, it doesn't really come across, you know, the ideas are not there. So usually when I have, when I start a shot, I think about the shot until I see it clearly in my head and then I start blocking it out. Right. No, that's excellent. That's very similar to the way that I, I work as well because I, I do my thumbnails in in stick figure mm-hmm. and it's more just um, – it's like a shorthand, you know, for myself to remember what the poses were and, and to lay them out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I do all the planning in my head again because I'm not confident in my own drawing skills. And I think that's a common trait among a lot of computer animators is mm-hmm. um, they went the computer way because they weren't good enough at drawing to become a traditional animator. Right. And um, yeah, no, that's that's interesting to hear to hear you uh, following a similar path. Yeah. Definitely read that book again. And there's another one. Yeah. I can't remember who wrote it. It's called uh, Improv. Yes, I got and that And that's too. a fantastic book. Yeah. Yeah, no, when you first read these books, a lot of it goes over your head or you're not ready to hear it yet. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, you just get through it to get through it. But no, savoring some of these ones is great. Um, Sorry to, to uh, lead it off another tangent, but uh, have you personally ever completed a work of passion or a piece of your own? A short film or anything like that? No, not since I started working professionally. Well, well, you did your shorts at school, um, and I've done personal animation last year. I tried to do it every now and then. Um, it's not a short; it's just an exercise um, mm-hmm. because there's some things that you don't do at work, just style-wise, and um, sometimes it kind of loses a sense of timing in terms of just cartoony and snappy stuff. So I try to do exercise at home. To get back into that, kind of train my my you know um, stylized muscle, I guess. But um, big work like a short, no, it's just, it's really difficult to find the time. Um, so with work mm-hmm. and overtime, and then uh, wife and my, my son is twelve year old, so it's you know I want to spend time with them. So it's it's a it's a difficult juggling act uh, to do something on the side. Hmm. So definitely an advice to all the students out there, you know, if you're single, uh, use every minute. <laughs> Do whatever you can because you got the time and the energy. Yes, you lucky, lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's actually really interesting that you mentioned that because um, I often uh, teach and preach that if you don't do work in your own time, then you're not a professional animator, even if you're being paid. Mm-hmm. And I liken it to an athlete because if, if an athlete only showed up to the games and tried to just play the games, he's not a professional and he's not going to be paid to do his sport much longer. Mm-hmm. He has to show up for training. Right. And it's the same with work. If you only go to work and only animate at work, you're going to be pigeonholed. You're going to be locked into that style. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you need to go and do you know, some animation push-ups where you just go and do some animation. Maybe it's just a bouncing ball, but you do it in a mm-hmm. snappy way to keep uh, those animation muscles limber and, and so that you can still use those styles. Yeah. So it's great to hear that you do that because I'm the same. I don't have enough time to do a whole short film of my own uh, anymore. And so, yeah, just short, quick exercises I find really help keep my skills sharp. Mm-hmm. So uh, just to get a bit technical, what uh, what is your favorite piece of software to do 3D or even 2D animation? Uh, I only worked in Maya, so I would have to say Maya. <laughs> okay. Uh, we did a little bit of 2D in, in school, um, but, you know, again, my skills are just so minimal. <laughs> There's nothing going on there. Uh, I used to use Quick Checker and the webcam because uh, I like to work at home and not in the labs. But then we, we learn and train in Maya. Um, and that's actually all I know. But it's I tried some other other um, packages, and it's you know they're they're mostly not that difficult. It's it's all 
hopefully you got the nice graph editor and you set keys and then that's it and the rigs are you know light and fast um so it's not it's not that much of a, a you know a problem to learn different packages because it's it's technically all, always the same principles but you know some packages are better than others but i'm very comfortable in maya but because i've worked on it right. for so long right and do you feel that it's important for an animator to be comfortable with their software and with the rigs Yes, um, only because <clears throat> it's kind of like you, if you can't draw <laughs> and you want to do 2D animation, you know the principles, you know your characters, but you can't draw, so it's going to look bad. So the same thing I think is with software, is that you have all those ideas, but um, for instance, you want to have a guy pick up a bottle, but you don't know how to do constraints and you're not familiar with how to do that, that's going to hinder your animation and, and it's going to be very limiting. So obviously it's not about the software, it's about the animation skills, but if you don't know your software, then you're screwed. So I think you know, if, you, if you know which software you're going to use in the future or one you know, that you really like, try to find out the most, um, you know, the most technique, uh, the, all the technical things. Not that you have to know all the rendering and the lighting, but definitely in terms of how to use the rigs and constraints and just things that help with your animation. Excellent. Yeah, I, I've always wondered um, what kind of exposure to a rig do you get before you have to animate a scene with that rig? Do do you have like a standardized um, set of controls on a rig? Or yes. um, okay, so there's not much of a learning curve when you get a new rig and a new character. No, uh, again, I'm not too sure how much I'm allowed to say, but we just we have right. a, a broad um, setup that usually doesn't really change unless the design asks for certain changes. But that's the cool thing about work is that it's very standardized and it's, the controls are huge. I mean, there's so much stuff you can do. Um, it's very, very freeing. And that's always a great thing when that I tell the students that, you know, you might have to work with really bad rigs um, at school. You know, they might not have the best rigs in the world. But once you start at the company, usually um, the quality goes up tremendously. And that's really freeing. So sometimes they might get worried about, well, can I do this? Can I do that? But then once you start at the company, it, it gets easier from a technical point of view sometimes only it's the the rig is maybe heavy or the the model is very detailed so it's not as fast like some of the, the online rigs that are free um, are really fast and sometimes at work they're really slow but it's you know there's a huge difference in, in detail and complexity um, mm -hmm. but there's never really a learning curve and I, I I would assume that most companies have that where it's kind of a standardized thing and maybe you know depending on specific characters it might be a bit different but even right. then, even even if there is a learning curve, um, at least at work where I'm, it's there's a huge support group and and they help you with tools and scripts and you can ask everybody; they all help you. Right. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of people wonder, you know, should they learn this software package? Should the should they learn that? And my personal opinion is that you just need to learn the the principles. So mm -hmm. if you're using Cinema 4D or you know anything like that, it's okay as long as you're learning the principles. Mm -hmm. I think Maya is pretty. Um, it's it's they use a lot of companies I think I think if there's one yeah, it, one package it's definitely Maya that will help you yeah definitely I think if you want to work in in feature films then mm -hmm. Maya if you want to work in games or television possibly 3D Studio Max right. and uh, a lot more are, are starting to turn to XSI I I mm, found okay. yeah, it definitely but, helps uh, well you that, because, that's um, this side of the world but the companies won't have to train you or not as long yes if you know that that's always good. Yeah, um, I don't know if you can if you can say this or not. If you can't, just tell me. But do you get uh, any time to get into character of of the creature or person that you're animating? Uh, sometimes, sometimes no. Uh, it just all depends. You might have uh, you know work that's kind of last minute, um, helping out other companies or something that you were going to work on for a year. So and it depends on the, on the clients and um, that's all over the place. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I guess um. I, I usually ask a question about who's the most important person in the production pipeline for for um, an animator, but I guess, uh, yeah, if you wanted to take that question, but I think you've sort of already answered that. Who who would be the most important person for you in your animation pipeline? Besides yourself, obviously. <laughs> um, well, for the supervisor. Uh, it, it all depends on who is leading the show, um, but you know, the supervisor mm -hmm. usually has all the all the answers to my. To my little questions, um, and then whoever is leading the technical group, just in case there is something with with rigs. Right. 
yeah, I guess you you probably uh, definitely got it made as far as rigging goes. There, you don't have to work with with uh, poorly built rigs, so that'd be quite freeing, as you said. Do you have any technical tips you'd give to aspiring CG artists? That anything that they should definitely learn before they um, try and move on, or try and master any technical aspect. Technical aspects. You know, the only thing that would stand out right now is that I mean, besides your, you know, if you go to a school, you get your general education on rigs and and setup and rigging and all that. Um, it definitely helps if you're familiar with the basic rigging and basic modeling so you, when you when you take a rig that's free online that you're able to um, modify it you know add wigs mustache props just little things that make the the rigs look different and I think that's something that I hear a lot I mean it's there's always an exception you can always have a fantastic animator that takes your basic rig and it looks fantastic um, but it helps to make your rig look different because I think it's really difficult and sometimes annoying for recruiters to look at reels and it's always the same rig you know it, it gets it's unfair f for the people um s submitting the the reels but you have to also see the other side if all day you see the same rig and the same animation mm. the same style so the moment you see a different character and appealing design that will stand out not that it's fair but you have to think about you know how can you make your like uh real look different um so if you have any skills in modifying rigs you know a different nose different ears just anything so it's not your default look. Um, I think that will help. No, that's excellent. That's a great tip, actually. Uh, moving on to inspiration. What inspires you? Do you have any regular um, go-to books or TV shows or films? Uh, no, it's usually my students because they kick my butt. You know, I see their work and I go, holy crap. <laughs> um, that's huge motivation. Uh, and then just any movie that comes out or I mean I try to watch whatever I can uh, I don't always have time but you know the big feature movies and TV shows shorts um, but you know I always, I always go online and I check a lot of sites online because you always see you know the, the shorts from the schools in France they're really really good um, it's just a continuation of things I get emails of, from a guy and he says you know watch this and I go holy crap so it's it's kind of cornerstone internet movies and my students I guess okay excellent have you have you ever experienced creative block or animators block yes all and if time. so how do you get past that uh, I slap myself and then I continue um, it's really hard it's just I think I go back and I watch my favorite movies um, you know that get me excited again about acting and, and or animation movies where I go oh this performance is really cool because sometimes I I just I just don't remember how to do things. I'm I'm too set in my in my ways, or maybe you know the work is always kind of the same. Um, and then I usually just go back to my favorite movies, and then um, and then what I like to do also it's um, there's a site called the Eleven Second Club, and you submit your oh, animation yes. every month. You have a, a sound bite, and that's really helpful too because there are so many submissions and so many different types of um, you know animation techniques and, and clips and that helps too because you see you see what not to do because there's a lot of um, cliche acting in it because there's such a huge vo volume of people submitting but then you also get a lot of uh, very original stuff and I think that helps me too to look at that and go okay well this is what people are doing this is kind of what a lot of people are doing that's not quite working and then there's other stuff that's really original and then that kind of sparks you know new interest and new motivation um, but yes, I do have animators block all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, have you ever had to create inspiration for your teams that you were leading? Uh, yes. Well, I only had one show where I was uh, a lead, but it's <clears throat> sometimes you can have challenging shots or a lot of changes, and you know you try to to help them with tools with things that they need acting reference or just you know or just moral support but sometimes um it just can be a really tough show mentally and then um i mean i didn't have that much experience with it but i was you know you try to do the best you can and it's but you as a lead you still animate you still do the same work so you know exactly how they feel to a certain point um but same thing for instance with, with students or people that ask for help or online critiques um you know you always you always try to give them um, a light at the end of the tunnel.
because sometimes it gets real difficult for them and they know about the industry they know about the economy and it's difficult to find jobs and visas but it's always it's it's still really worth it i know it's really difficult to get in but once you're in it um it's just so rewarding that you get actually paid to do your little movies and i think um <clears throat> It's just, I think that's that's always the biggest thing to me when I see someone who's not motivated mm-hmm. anymore, who needs help, uh, or help, you know, that sounds so preachy, but um, once you work on that movie or on your show or in your game, when you see that and you see people enjoying your work, um, that's all That's all I need. It's just it's it's just so motivating, motivating and it keeps you going. You know, when you, you see that movie and you see your scene and then you hear the people laugh during that scene and it worked, and uh, that's, uh, that's all I need. <laughs> no, that's excellent. That's really good. Do you think that there's uh, such a thing as bad inspiration, or what? What do you think can suck people's inspiration? Probably just being exposed to the same style, same movies from the same country. I think each country has a specific style. Um, I think American, you know, feature movies have a specific style. Uh, and then you look at, um, you know, movies in France or even even just sh- shorts from students all over the world. They, they have their own styles. So I think. Um, try to look at as much as you can different countries different people different styles and live action and animation you know some people are just focused on just animation and just from whatever country and I think you gotta look mm. around uh, it's not it's not there's so much out there that was just a short oh, what was it called like guys from uh, students from France and I think they quit their school to do their own style it just came out. It was featured on uh, Cartoon Brew. And of course, I forgot the name. I'm not going to touch my browser, otherwise this is going to crash here, this session. Um, what was it called? It was fantastic. I don't remember. <laughs> but go on Cartoon Brew and, and uh, you know look, look around. There's a lot of stuff out there. All right, excellent. So um, where do you see yourself going from here? What What do you have going at the moment? And where would you see yourself maybe in five years? <clears throat> let's see well probably more going towards um, lead positions and you know 5-10 years supervising positions because I really like it I like I love animating and it's kind of a double edged sword where you go if you go more into the managing position you, you have less time and you animate less so I'm not at that point yet I'm not I'm not all about career in the first place so I, I still really love animation so I think at this point I just want to really hone my skills and then you know more realistic animation more cartoony animation really have a broad skill set and then venture into more the career type where it's more you know lead and supervising and um, sometimes people ask me do you want to direct the movie and it's like no <laughs> I just don't know enough <laughs> I have so much more to learn maybe in the future yes I love movies I love sci- I would love to do a sci-fi movie but you know that's really far away <laughs> right now. I think right now it's just basically um, just the skill set, just learning more about animation, and then slowly building on that. I'm not, I'm not okay. in a hurry. Um, you know, I'm not in it for for all the money in the career. And it's, I don't think it's, it's as an animator. I think you you can't really be into that. It, I, it should be a job choice um, out of passion, and not a career choice. Um, because I think if you're just in right. it and you just kind of do the work, it's just not the same. You really have to love it. Definitely, yeah. It's a lot of work, and you're not going to get rich. You know, you're not going to be uh, a millionaire being an animator, but <laughs> you're going to be happy. I yes. think. So, what would be the perfect retirement for you? <laughs> the perfect retirement: uh, a beach, big house, sunny, the web, so I can browse the web. Um, yeah, and a fast laptop. And a fast course. laptop, right? No crashes. <laughs> um, you know, that's a good question. I I always liked the whole nine old men days where you can animate until you're really old, and I kind of that's kind of the retirement I would like to see. Is when I see those pictures and you see those animators and you go, wow, but they're forty and they're fifty, and now it feels like you know all the guys they come in and they're they're twenty five, they're really young and you're almost being pushed to do so much good work in you know such a short amount of time and you have to go and be you know a lead and a supervisor and it's you wonder um can you still be just an animator at 40 or 50 i don't know if that still works nowadays but i would i would love it to be like that i would like to be able to you know to still animate 
when I'm old. But it's you know it's difficult because I think nowadays if you if you work for that long, hopefully your salary will also go up. But then after a while, you're just too expensive for companies, and then you get a new guy mm. come in that's you know a third of your price and is ten times better than you. <laughs> so that's a bit <laughs> tricky. Um, so that would be my perfect retirement, I guess, to not retire, to always be able to work. Um, but you know, see how it goes. I mean, I got I got a great family in it, and I I was already so lucky enough in my career with the with the shows that I worked on. Um, it sounds corny, but I mean, I think I'm already so fortunate that if I can just retire and have you know a pension that lasts until I'm dying, that's fine. Uh, excellent. No, it sounds like you really uh, thoroughly enjoy and love animation. So, good on you. I think mean, I think that's what it takes, you know, to make it to to the top. You know, the position like where you're at, uh, animating for your favorite company and living in the country you want, no matter where you came from. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's uh, that's great. You've definitely done well. All right, we've got a bit of a traditional CG SWAT and animation salvation pop quiz here. So um, I don't know if you watch the Actors Studio, Inside the Actors Studio, yes. but it's similar to that. So um, who is the most famous person you've ever met? <laughs> <laughs> wow, the most famous person I ever met. Just visually seeing or talking to? Uh, I'd say talking to. Because you're probably talking to. I hope you're not like weighing up George Lucas and Michael Bay in your mind, going, "Who's more famous?" Right now, <laughs> kind of. I mean, sometimes we have you know Q and As at work, so you got you know Quentin Tarantino and people like that. Um, and you say oh, wow. you say a quick hi, so I don't know if that counts. Um, I, um, that's a good question. I don't have. Well, that I guess much... who, who have you met that made you feel starstruck? Oh wow! Um, there was Robert Downey Jr. that came by work. Um, J.J. Abrams, the director, he's just he's oh, yeah. such a nice person. Um, you know, any client that comes by, I mean, you know, all the, hey, even if I see still George Lucas at work, I'm just like, wow, that's that's him. You know, sometimes you see Steven Spielberg in the dining commons. Um, I met, mm -hmm. um, I didn't talk to, but I I met um, the actor who played Chewbacca. <laughs> um, oh yeah. I even saw the real prop from R2D2, and you know, I'm even. Um, starstruck when I see props. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. We are very fortunate where we have um, you know, clients, sometimes actors that come by that say hi, and it's it's really interesting actually when you don't know who it is. Um, we had just recently. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but maybe just cut that out. But uh, the director of Up in the Air and Juno, he came by and came by our cubicles and said hi. I had no idea who it was. Um, and I guess I just treated him like, you know, a regular person, like, Hey, who are you? I am. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? And then afterwards to say, Hey, that's the director of up in the air. It's like, Oh, holy crap. It was a, I really liked the movie and it was interesting. Yeah. When you don't know who it is. Um, I remember bumping into Brad Bird, um, at oh, Skywalker yes. Ranch at the, uh, the fitness center. Uh, again, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I had no idea who it was. I never, I had never seen. Um, his face. I didn't know who it was. I remember coming down, um, and the guys that were with, um, and a friend of mine who was actually working uh, on one of his movies, they were talking together, and I didn't know. So he was just, I was just, I got to the group and listened, and 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 Brad Pitt was talking about the third reel of the movie, and I believe it was Incredibles back then. He was talking about the sound, and I thought he was talking about Episode Three, Star Wars. And I had seen the reel because you know I was working on it, so I was kind of nodding, going, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." And he looked at me, going, "How would you know what I'm talking about? Well, you haven't seen the movie." But I had no idea. So, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." And I then he <laughs> left, and I goes, "Who was that?" And that was Brad Bird. Holy crap! So you know, you always hope that you don't offend them, or but you know, they're still regular people, but still, <laughs> you're still going, "Oh wow, that's that's the guy." So yeah, I mean, it, you're definitely <laughs> very fortunate in that industry that you get to meet those people, and it's. You know, you think that they're just regular people, but I guess because you see them in making ofs and you know their movies and, and uh, the person stands in front of you, you go, wow. Uh, it's like Frank Oz, the voice of Yoda and Miss Piggy. Uh, really nice guy. And again, you meet him and you go, wow, that's the guy. That's the guy from my childhood, you know. Hmm. Yeah. That's excellent. That was nice to hear. What What would you say is your favorite movie of all time, if you could pick one? I don't think I can pick one. 
Yeah, don't worry. I hate those kind of questions too. I don't even have a favorite <laughs> uh, color, so it's it like... all. You know, it all depends on the mood. If I'm in a in a in a bat, not bat mood, but I kind of need like a you know a perky thing that sets me in a good mood, I just watch Raiders of the Lost Ark or Empire Strikes Back, <laughs> Monsters Inc. You know, like some movies are just they just make me happy. I don't know why. You know, it's like a good feeling. Ah, oh, yeah, like Goonies and Ghostbusters, Back to the Future. Um, I really like nice. Shawshank Redemption. Um, but you know, there's so many newer movies. Oh, yeah. um, what was the What was the last movie that I really liked? There's so many. I mean, like um, How to Train Your Dragon. It's great. But it's difficult. Yeah. I mean, it's just you almost get sometimes technical. Like C- Citizen Kane. I still love that movie. Um, yeah, that's a movie that people just don't seem to know anymore. I I quote that all the time, and people are like, "What?" I go, "Rosebud," and people are like, <laughs> what? "What? You got a problem?" But even like older ones, like, like uh, Psycho, a lot of Hitchcock movies. North by Northwest is is definitely one of my favorite movies. Um, the uh, Thing, yes. John Carpenter's The Thing. I just love that movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, the original. Well, the black and white, but I love Carpenter's version. I really like that one. The, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that one's actually scary. The original is just kind of entertaining for a whole other reason. <laughs> yes. Same with The Fly. Um, Eastern Promises, History of Violence. A lot of Cronenberg movies are great. Um, Kubrick, you know, all his movies are great. The Shining, love The Shining. It's real difficult. And sometimes you have movies that are great, but they're really depressing, like Midnight Express. I thought it was a really great movie, but it's oh, not yeah. like, yeah, let's pop that in and watch that movie. <laughs> this is really depressing. <laughs> Um, The Matrix, the first one, really like that movie. Uh, Dark City, love that one. Oh, there's so many, so difficult. Yeah. Um, Coen Brother movies, Fargo, um, The Man Who Wasn't There. I actually really liked um, No Country for Old Men, despite the ending. A lot of people didn't like the ending. I like mm. I like how it ended. Uh, there will be blood. So many. It's just really difficult to to pick out that one movie. <laughs> But you know, it's Are you a fan of David Lean at all? Um David Lean directed like Bridge on the River Kwai and Doctor Zhivago yes, and Lawrence but of it's, Arabia. You know all those movies, I love them. I really like um Bridge on the River Kwai, but it's it, it's my mom's favorite movie besides Sound of Music. So it's Oh right. I yes, but it's also it's there's a huge influence of childhood memories. <laughs> you know? I really like them. But sometimes, you know, you watch them again, and then, like, I haven't seen um, Dr. Chihuahua in a long time. Because my dad used to have all those movies, and we watched them when I was really young. So some of them I haven't seen since. Lawrence of Arabia, for instance, I haven't seen in a long time. Easy Rider, way too young when I saw that. I probably did, had no idea what was going on. Um, right. So I would have to watch them again. Um, but yes, all those old classics. Um, Planet of the Apes, the old one. Love that one. Mm. Um Charlton Heston was just an amazing actor yeah, in his time. Ten like you look at him now and you're like, how did he get away with acting like that? Yes, the music <laughs> was just... great in Planet of the Apes. But yeah, I mean uh, the Ten Commandments and Ben Hur, uh, the Charlton Heston mm. version, love that one. Um, actually, the old, um, the old Peter Sellers, Pink Panther, or the Party. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, the Party was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, once you start going down there and you go, wow, but well, then this one and then this one, they just, it just, you branch out and there's so many good ones. Yeah, I've, I've actually, uh, I have a suitcase filled with DVDs, two suitcases filled with DVDs in a friend's closet in Spain because when I flew over there, I brought all of my DVDs with me and then I couldn't afford to bring them back. <laughs> so I'm like, I feel like part of me is missing because all my DVDs are in a closet in Spain, so... You're naming all these movies. I'm like, oh, that's in the suitcase. <laughs> Stop it. It's like a stab every time. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is like my family's just the opposite. I love all these classic movies and I'll get together with my parents. And I'm like, let's watch Lawrence of Arabia or you know, a Hitchcock film. My parents are like, man, can't we just watch Kick-Ass or something like that? <laughs> nice. So it's the exact opposite. Wow. There's like, I have to convince my, fam- my parents to watch these classic movies. No, it's a classic movie. Yeah, but Kick-Ass is great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that's definitely the opposite. With my dad, it's um, I always fall asleep too <laughs> during the movies. I mean, not to not to be mean to my parents, um, but definitely <laughs> older stuff. But you know, but thanks to him, I saw things like the late the lady vanishes or Dial M for murder, 
and stuff like that. And it's just, mm. I still really like those movies. But again, is it because I saw them with my parents and the, the memories? But some of them I watch now, and and they're they're still hold up. They're still really really well done. Um, I just I just bought North by Northwest on on Blu-ray, and it's just I love that movie. But then again, I love that movie in German. I know it sounds really weird, <laughs> but it's just I, <laughs> I grew up with that movie in German. It's like the classic Star Wars trilogy. Love them in German. They're okay in English. Whereas the new the prequels, they're you know for what they are, the prequels are great in English. Uh, not so much in German. The dubbing is really bad. Um, same thing with. Do you remember Stripes? Bill Murray. The with the stripes. stripes. Oh yes, okay. The go, war go, film. The, yeah, I was yeah. thinking of the the zebra film with Chris Rock for a second. No, uh, that's, no, no, not like... that one. No, stripes. <laughs> all those old ones are up to creek. Uh, even Spaceballs, Ghostbusters. I just saw, a lot of them for me because yeah. I grew up with them in in German. Back to the Future. Um, they're just they're just really great in German, and I every, every time I tell that people, they just look at me like, why? They have to be. The original language, <laughs> and I agree. I mean, you should watch movies subtitled, um, and some movies I will never touch. All the movies that I started watching in English ever since I got here, uh, or when I started in Switzerland, I will not watch them in German. And some some actors I refuse to watch. Though, for instance, like Morgan Freeman, um, such a great voice, and I don't want to listen to that in German. Um, mm-hmm. That's probably why I like Shawshank Redemption so much. The music, the acting, the voices. Um, or someone like Fran Drescher, you'd probably prefer to watch in German. The yeah, nanny. she has a ah. funny laugh though <laughs> in English. But yeah, some stuff is better. Some stuff is really good in French. And some, I, I remember watching ER, and I remember watching it all over the place. I watched it in German, French, and English. And actually, I like all of them. Some actors better than others. Some voices are great. Okay. Same with X Files. I love X Files in French. <laughs> That's just strange. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I never knew that as an American, like how how much other countries dub. You know, especially Germany and Spain, mm-hmm. um, they dub everything. And when I moved to Spain, I I had no idea. And I pride myself on doing a fantastic Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation, and no one had ever heard Arnold Schwarzenegger before in Spain. And so I'm like doing this Arnie impersonation with some guys when they they're looking at me like I'm retarded or something. You know, just what what's wrong? Are you okay? I'm like, no, give me a beer. <laughs> what what's wrong with you? But you Get know, out of here! That's that's oh, that's a great impression. Um, but it's it's a good example because, um, even though he's Austrian, his voice is dubbed by a German actor, and when you, <laughs> when I watch him in English, it sounds silly, not to you know to knock him, but when I watch him in German, um, the voice actor is actually really really good, and I think sometimes I, I mention movies and people laugh oh that was such a silly movie but the dubbing in German was so much better uh, it was so different mm. that it probably sometimes elevated the quality of the movie like Schwarzenegger is really cool in German <laughs> so and then you watch him in English and you go eh, you know not always um, but I think yeah I have that for, for some of the movies and sometimes it's also very different I remember watching Star Trek The Next Generation and Wesley Crusher in German has a very high kid type voice and it was kind of annoying and then I just recently watched it in that's my phone watched it uh, in English and Will Wheaton actually has a much deeper voice and it's it's, mu- it's much better I don't know I have m- more, much more respect for him <laughs> watching it in <Right>. English <laughs> it's, it's funny it's actually good as an animator looking at that because you can see how much the voice can affect um the animation and it can change your animation decisions based right. on the voice and everything. Right. So, trying. I'm trying to bring it back to animation because we're going off right. off track again. Exactly. That's all right. All right. Back to our uh, uh, James Lipton questions. If you could possess any superpower, what would it be? Uh, flying. All right, excellent. That's that seems to be what everyone says. So that uh, that was mine as well. It's because if I can fly, I wouldn't have to pay for um, plane tickets. Are really expensive, and I could see my parents more often. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. I know the feeling. Yeah, all my family's in Detroit, and I'm in Sydney. Ooh, so yeah. Of course, plane tickets to Detroit are really cheap because no one wants to go there. <laughs> okay, if you could bring life to any fictional character, which would it be? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Fictional, as in you know, anything animated or movies. There's anything created, books, anything. 
Yes, yeah, any any fictional character, make them a real person. Like Pinocchio. I'm a real boy! Perfect. Wow, I like that question. Um, for a second, it was selfish going the genie from Aladdin so he can help me <laughs> do things. That's a really good question. It would be really cool to have Darth Vader around you. <laughs> um, as long as he's on your side. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good question. Um, Doc Brown would be cool. <laughs> But in German or in English? <laughs> uh, you know, in both. I started to listen. Okay. The other weird thing is I rip movies to just uh, MP3s, and I listen to them in my car on, on my way to work because it's 45 minutes to go to work. Um, and I'm starting to listen to a lot of movies. And I started to listen to them in English as well. And, um, you know, some movies I turn to where I go much better in English. Like I used to love The Thing actually in German, and now I love it in English, I guess. But, yeah, Doc Brown in English would be cool. Excellent. All right. With the time machine. With the I time imagine. machine. That would be awesome. Wait, I have to ask, what how do they translate great Scott into German? Uh he just says, he says uh, Great Scott. No, it's just great God. Cosa Gott. Okay. And then when he goes, Oh that's that's heavy. Uh he just says it means strong. Oh, that's a stock. Stock. Yeah. It's it's a bit different. But some stuff, some stuff still right. works. Interesting, yeah, yeah. Well, because the whole time I was in Spain, I went to every movie was in Spanish, obviously, except um, uh, what was the movie with the uh, demon barber, uh, Johnny Depp, uh, Sweeney Todd. I went mm. and saw Sweeney Todd, mm -hmm. and the whole movie was in Spanish except for the songs. All the songs were in English, <laughs> so it was really odd that they would change voice, you know, halfway through the movie and break into song in English and then back to speaking Spanish. I remember watching uh, The Faculty anyway. in Spain. I was uh, touring backpack tour with a friend of mine, and he wanted to go watch a movie. And it was The Faculty in s in Spanish, and we didn't understand anything. Uh, so we just had to go off <laughs> the audience reactions, and they were kind of freaked out. But it was really weird. You're so detached if you don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, uh, back to James Lipton's questions. What are the three things you couldn't live without? My wife, my son, and the web. <laughs> I should probably put in my family, my parents in there. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, obviously my my parents, but uh, wife and kid. It just, it's just so funny how when I started and I was single and it was all about animation and that was my priority and mm -hmm. it was all about that. And then now wife and kid, it's it's. Not to you know knock down the work, but it's it has become work where I really look forward to going home and seeing my family because I see my coworkers more than my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a scary thought, but that's probably true actually. And I do love the web. I mean, I it's for for multiple reasons. We just um, last year got my parents uh, an iMac, so we can do iChat, so I can see them now through um, you know through the camera. So there's a lot of good stuff um, online. So it's. I'm definitely uh, very dependent on it, on email, you know, um, keeping up with friends. and It's almost sad <laughs> that I have to mention something so technical, but it's, um, I look at it how, how I can still stay in contact with people. That's really great. Right. Yeah, no, that's good. Sounds like, uh, yeah, relationships, which I think is what life is all about, is mm -hmm. relationships. What, uh, what would be, do you have a favorite quotation? And if so, what is it? Um, not that I always use it, but I have a, I guess a couple. I really like um, pain is temporary, film is forever. <laughs> that always <laughs> that always helps me during shows. I think Peter Jackson said that during a uh, Lord of the Rings or King Kong. I don't remember. Probably Lord of the Rings. Um, I got a big poster that my wife has uh, downstairs. Uh, Keep calm and carry on. I think that always helps me. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. I like that pain is temporary, film is forever. That's uh, <laughs> spoken like a true director. <laughs> nice. Actually, I, I just heard a really good one today by a guy. He said, until you spread your wings, you have no idea how far you can fly. Hmm. I thought that mm -hmm. was really good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that, that uh, pretty much brings us back to the end of uh, the formal interview, I guess. So thank you very much for your time. Um, in conclusion, would you suggest any sort of formal training 
for people wanting to get into animation? Well, define formal training. Like school? Just going to school? Yeah, like an actual school, yeah. Um, so yes. like what you did with the Academy of Art, yes? Yeah, because the thing is... Well, yes and no. The thing is, it goes back to relationships. I mean, it's it's really... Um, you just can't just have an online exposure to school and then being holed up in your room and just do that. I think it's really important that you mingle with people um, for a the social aspect and also being able to work with other people. And that's what I really like about a, a physical school um, because you're there with your classmates. And it's, just, it's a different feeling if you're in class with people, you see the teacher and you can directly interact. Um, so sometimes some online training can be tricky because it's just a webcam and it's just an email um, so it's you know it's not that easy and I really like animation mentor in that aspect because it's they have a huge forum they really try to let the people commu communicate through you know whatever means but then they also have a lot mm -hmm. of gatherings they got barbecues they got the graduation they still try to get people together and they know it's difficult because it's an online school but they're doing whatever they can to make it um, you know more uh, personal and I think that's really important. So uh, if you can, if you can go somewhere, if you if you have to go a different country, but if you can go to a school, uh, just as long as long as you have physical contact with people, um, even if you're just in a lab and you work on your stuff, but you're working with other people, I think it just really really helps. Yeah, I can I can second that. Just uh, recently, I've been doing a lot of freelance traveling, and recently I've been doing freelance from home. Mm -hmm. um, and it is it's very lonely you know you you get your critiques and that but you know you're working alone and mm -hmm. yeah there's nothing like being in a room with a bunch of other animators yeah. and there's just a great buzz and you can show people your work and get a million ideas like you said straight off the bat so mm -hmm. yeah there's something to be said for physical schools but i think animation mentor is such a great opportunity for so many people though you know it opens up training that they never would have had a chance to get yes. any other way yes and, so it's just, and it's a great. I wouldn't system. avoid it. That's the way it's, it's also um, taught by by uh, you know people who are working. But sometimes you get teachers that don't work mm -hmm. um, that don't work anymore, and they have a lot of experience. But sometimes it's also a bit disconnected from what's going on right now. And with the mentors, you know, they are still working while they're teaching. So it's you know you get you're always up to date on things, and it's it's really really a good system. Yeah, I agree. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. What what would be your best tip for building a great uh, show reel? Um, well, it's the old saying, you know, keep your 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 reel is only as good as your worst clip. Um, don't be afraid to kill your babies. I guess that's one of, one of those sayings. You, know, you have to kill your babies. Um, just not to show... be taken out of context. <laughs> no, yeah, don't you just that <laughs> clip? Yeah, kill your babies. Um, show it to <laughs> other people and really be able to be honest to yourself and be able to let go of a shot. Sometimes you put a shot in there and like, I really like it, but you like it because of while you worked on it or what it means to you, but not for what it really is. So you got to be able to really have just the strongest work on there. And again, don't, don't, um, don't fluff it. Don't put in too much just because you want to have two minutes. Um, if you only have 30 seconds, but it's fantastic. That's okay. Um, again, a minute would be better, but you know, sometimes I just saw a shot today from from uh, an animator, and it was so good, and it was maybe 15 seconds long, but it was so good that you could just have that shot on there, and I would still hire you. <laughs> you know, not that you should just have one shot right. on your reel, um, but definitely show it to people and just have the strongest, strongest work on there. Right, and uh, specifically to get into a place like ILM, what? What different aspects of your skill set do you think need to be shown? Um, the answer to that question will change depending on what project ILM is working on. So I know personally um, I applied there and I specifically wanted to work on the first Transformers movie, mm -hmm. but I didn't have anything that showed I could handle you know, massive, um, massive robots. And right. so they offered me work on another project that suited more the style of my reel, mm -hmm. which I didn't want. I was like, no, I want to work on Transformers. <laughs> and... And so, yeah, it, it didn't work out because of that because I didn't have the right stuff on my reel for what I wanted. And so I didn't attack that from the right angle what, for, what for that project? specific job. What other project was was offered? Uh, I believe it was Spiderwick, which just didn't interest me at all. So. Yeah, but in the, the end, it looked really Spiderwick cool. Spiderwick was so. more 
small that was actually more performance yeah it's little creatures and performance stuff yeah yeah and it's it's more my my area because i i do a lot of performance but i just love big things that it's because i've never worked on a project with it that i've never been able to animate that but mm -hmm. For someone like ILM, they're not going to take a gamble and go, no, believe me, I can do it. I know my reel doesn't show it, but I can do it. Trust me. And yeah, they're not going to go, yeah, we believe in you. That's so. the tricky thing, yeah, when you don't have – if it's a company or a product that doesn't have enough time to train people or, you know, kind of show them around where it's, you know, we got to finish this in two months. We need to have people right now. Um, yeah, mm. that's why you got to tailor your reel towards the project or the company. It's very important. Yeah, so I think that's a good – definitely a good tip to um, – yeah, tailor it to what you're applying for. And what would you say you should avoid when making your show real? Uh, well, definitely avoid anything that is offensive. You know, unless you're, uh, unless you apply for Rockstar Games, for instance, you can. You know, violence will not be an <laughs> issue. But you know, don't show a guy beating up another guy with tons of blood and send that to Disney. I don't think that will kind of work. You know, they might go, "Ah, oh, the animation is really <laughs> cool," but that's not really what we're doing. So, you know, I would say anything that offends people, you know, and you go into any, any sexual stuff, any religion, politics, um, racism, just anything, you know. Sometimes I get students that send me um, audio clips. Do you think that's, that's appropriate? And it's something from, uh, for instance, uh, Pulp Fiction. And, you know, half the stuff you just can't use. It's so offensive. You might, it's funny, but, you know, some people might think it's not that funny. So you have to be politically correct, right. I think. It's, it's sometimes not, you know, it's not... It kind of stifles your creativity sometimes, but you have to understand what the company is and what they're doing. So why why work so hard in your reel and then offend someone by having, you know, whatever F word in there? Just don't do that. Um, mm. Yeah, anything crazy like that. That's excellent. Just don't do it. <laughs> All right. What, what would be uh, the best piece of advice you could give to someone who wanted to uh, be a great animator and work for the best companies? Well, one thing would be once you start there, um, to be non-resistant to feedback. Um, that's something really, really important. And uh, I had that when I was a lead and, and I see it all the time around me or hear it from other people at other companies is that you don't want to get um, feedback from your client or anybody or the director and tells you, you know, you got to do this, this and this for your shot. And then the animator goes, I don't like those ideas. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, but you can't <laughs> you can't say that. You know, it's your your job is to do that work that someone tells you. So that's a big thing. The moment you you start, um, you got to be able to let go. It's not for you. You're doing it for someone else. So to be able to um, also be patient, because you might have a shot that you know you might have thirty versions on the shot, and then you got to be able to every new version attack as if it was the first time you did the shot. You know, you might do 10 versions and then they ask you to do something else and that was version two, but you know, you, sh you just, it's difficult, but you have to let go and you have to try to be always uh, motivated. And I think that's a really important thing once you start. Um, I don't know if the advice was to get into into a, a company. Um, yeah, again, I mean, it's just research and just just knowing the company, I think that's that to me is just a big thing. You have to know the company. You know, you have to know how they work, what they're doing. You know, you got companies that do feature right. animation where it it's a long project, so you have enough time for your family, and you might get crunch at the end. And you got companies that do a lot of you know kind of nine one one work where they help out or just do things at the end, and that's a lot of overtime. Or you got I think gaming companies do also a lot of overtime. It's just you got to know what you're getting yourself into. So don't be surprised if you have to suddenly work 18 hours a day, Saturday and Sunday, and then complain about it. So do your research first on what the company is and what the demands are. And you know, if they do pay overtime or not, it's really important. What kind of benefits? I know it's difficult to ask those questions when you're, you know, it's your internship or it's your first job. You don't want to come across and go, so uh, what are the benefits? You know, you <laughs> don't want to get the job. But um, after a while, you still have to think about what are they doing? What are they offering? Um and what are the demands, especially if you have a significant other, a boyfriend, girlfriend, pet, anything, you know, it's, you have to be, you have to know that for a while you will not see your friends and family because that's the industry. You will have crunch time and you will be at work for a long time. Not always, uh, but it can happen. So just be aware of that. 
No, that's definitely very good advice. And if I could add to it, I just think uh, taking responsibility for your education and your uh, abilities. Mm Because I think a lot of people these days, like like you were saying, they think if they just go to the school that has a good name, then they'll get a job. Mm -hmm. But as you you found out, it was only the people that actually worked hard to build a good reel. They took responsibility for that themselves. And they said, no, I'm – like you you said, I'm going to do what it takes Mm -hmm. to get the job and Mm -hmm. produce the good reel. And that's why you're at ILM, and uh, I don't know well, if anyone else from your from your class is there. Uh, but um, yes, some of them come and go. Um, I mean, I, I was still really lucky. It was it's that's the sad thing. You also have right. to be a little bit lucky just because of timing. You know, you can be you can be the greatest animator in the world. You can be fantastic, but if the company is not looking or has no money, there's no budget, or it's just not the style then you just won't get hired. So it's, you know, don't take it personally. It always depends on, on the, the field and the timing. Um, but yes, definitely take responsibility and don't lie. Don't lie on your on your resume. Don't say you can do, you know, <laughs> yes. you know this software and then you work there and you go, okay, we'll do this. Oh, I don't know it. You know, don't, <laughs> don't do that. Actually, I've seen people rip off my work online um, and I've seen, you know, my shot copied or my my clip online. So that's the other thing. I know it sounds really obvious, but people still do it. Don't steal other people's work. Don't do that because they will find out quickly and then you're blacklisted and it's just not worth it. I know it sounds really silly, yeah, but definitely. You know, I, I was really shocked that someone, not because I was offended, but I was shocked that people think that they can get away with that. It's such a small industry. Like, people will find out eventually. Mm. Actually, I, I had a student copy my entire showreel and just was <laughs> passing it around as their showreel. And wow. I, I had a company call me up and and they go, uh, you need to come in and have a look at this. And so I called the called the guy up and I was like, hey, um, I just had a look at your showreel and uh, it's my showreel. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was like, yeah, well, look, just fix it. And Yeah, I'm so sorry. What happened? I, I accidentally hit copy paste. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Just don't do that. Yeah, I don't know what goes through people's minds, but uh, I guess desperation. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I guess, yeah. But, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time, um, JD and no uh, Jean Denis. I'm glad I finally know how to uh, pronounce your name. <laughs> yeah, Jean Denis. JD is what I hear most of the time, but it's not Jean. I get a lot of genes, genes and emails and, and otherwise, but uh, I react to JD most of the time. Okay, excellent. Well, if if people want to look you up on the web or see your website or register for some of your training, where should they go? Where's the best place to go? Uh, you can just go to jeandenis.net, um, and that gives you links to to whatever. Like one of my main sites is um, spongella.com, where I just I just post stuff for my students or for myself, just you know clips that I don't have time to watch during the day, so I post it there so I can watch it at night. Um, but on there, you will have all the emails. You got you know, links to my to my email um, and to the workshops. Um, there's the one in San Francisco and there's one online, so it, it should be all there. And I have FAQs with all kinds of answers, but if there's anything you want to know or anything is not clear, um, just send me an email. I, I'll just respond. And if I don't respond, it's not because I don't like you. Uh, sometimes it gets a bit busy. Um, but if I don't respond after, you know, like three days or so, email me again and just bug me. Say, hey, I emailed you. What the hell? I say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'll respond. Uh, excellent. Yeah, so that's spongella.com. That's S P U N G E L L A yes. dot com. Yes. Is that correct? Okay, excellent. No, it's a really great site that I've uh, referred to many times thank over you. the years. And um no, thank you. It's it's animators like you that give back to to the community that uh help build the animators of tomorrow. And as I'm sure you're aware, it's it's much nicer to work with other animators who know what they're doing. So yes. it's 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 great to give back because we, in the end, we we benefit because we get better people on our teams in the future. So, no, thank you for supporting uh, Animation Salvation mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. doing this interview. And thanks for supporting the industry as well with uh, all your excellent uh, goodies and tidbits that you <laughs> do throughout there on Spongella. And, oh, you know, um, it's, the thing is that when I started, right after school, I was looking around, it was um, people like Keith Lango and, and Jason Schleifer that had so much stuff online already. Um, and you know, I mm-hmm. randomly emailed people for help, for critiques, and I was really surprised at how many people responded and gave me a huge amount of help and critiques. Um, and that was definitely a lasting impression. One of the main reasons why I'm doing this, because you know, why 
why should I leech off other people and then not give back? I mean, it's, I was really surprised and really happy how many people are helping. So, you know, if you have time mm. and if someone emails you, just email them back, quick little notes. It just it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it's true. I, I don't know if you're a, rem a member of the CG Char website. Yes. Uh, it was an online forum. Uh -huh. And that was fantastic. I mean, that's where I learned to animate because I, I never went to any proper school for animation. Uh -huh. And I would just go on there and I would bug people and I'd get critiques. And like you said, it's because of the kindness of people's hearts. Uh, you know, Sean Kelly used to be on there a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I met Ed Hooks. He was very active cool. there. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's it's almost died now. It um, has, yes. It still exists. Yes, yeah, really weird. But it's, it's only... almost... Well, I'm I'm guilty of that too. I I stopped looking and stopped posting. Um, I don't know why and when that happened, but it it suddenly got more quiet. And I remember, um, it used to be the ten second club that used to be through email. Yes. Um, and then yes. that died. But then the eleven second club started up again. That's a huge part now. But yes, that's true. CG. I never knew it was CG Char, CG Care, how you would pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, yeah was... I just said CG Char because it's phonetic. Yeah. That's how it's spelled. So. It was a great site. I mean, definitely. And they had those interviews with with animators, and it was a huge help. Actually, since yeah, I'm, no, since, it's great. Since I'm doing an interview here, and I'm, not that I'm, you know, I need to uh, name drop, but since I have now an, an opportunity to publicly thank people, um, uh, I definitely not that I want to kick, uh, you know, kiss some some butt here. But the biggest help was um, Victor Navone and Cameron Miyazaki from Pixar. I have to say, just because oh, yes. I was looking, I was trying to find people that would help me. And I did a Google search and I did at ilm.com and at pixar.com. And I was snooping around and they gave me emails <laughs> and then I uh, emailed them and they actually emailed back. And I remember, I think it was Victor Nivone where he would say, yeah, send me something. And I sent him three clips because I thought he would, he would, he would have to always respond to people. And he was, you know, so kind to do that. And I thought he always probably sees the same clips. So I thought I just sent him three so he can choose, but I think my wording was really bad. So he thought he, I want a critique for all three of them, but you know, but he <laughs> did. He said, "Hey, you know, I ask only for one, but he gave me three. But then he still critiqued page long for each shot, and that was really impressive, wow. and that helped me a lot. So uh, definitely, thank you to those two guys. It was a huge help. It was very in depth and very very focused critique. It was really really cool. So thank you. Yeah, well, I guess that that shows why you love the internet because it's yes. very powerful. You can just email people and they do respond. So yeah. you can invade people's privacy. What? And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did some similar things, but I don't want to uh, <laughs> to make any anybody mad by giving away how to find their email addresses. <laughs> but yes, well, no, I I hope that uh, I hope uh, we'll see you uh, being active in the animation salvation forums because I'm trying mm -hmm. to recreate that sort of uh, feeling where people. They help out, and then you don't have to go searching for people's email addresses because they're there. And um, you're only in the community when you're active, when you have time. Right. So hopefully hopefully it's going to build into that, and it's really, really shaping up. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you. No problem. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll uh, have another interview very shortly. We'll, we'll get some, some other questions back, and I'll get them to you. And Cool. We might have to edit this and uh, get a few things okayed with – with your superiors before we post it, but we'll see. Yes. Yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> you never All know. Right. All right, Jean-Denis, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure, and I will talk to you again soon. Okay. And to all of our listeners out there, thanks very much, and please check out spongella.com, and uh, come on to uh, Animation Salvation and go into the Mentorium Forum and uh, post what you thought about uh, this interview and say a special thanks to Jean-Denis in there. And I'll see you guys online. Thanks very much.